go on jurists and you have to be very careful you don't get all your members arrested by saying something courageous and then getting on an airplane and leaving town. Exactly. You know? So, does that explain? And Penn is, if you have a stutter, it's poets, playwrights, essayists, and novelists. So it's Penn, really, you know. Mm. Uh, but now we have screenwriters, journalists, translators, publishers. And it's worth noting that more than 50% of our cases now come to us through digital expression. It's yeah. more and more, we've, we've embraced that as well. So a, a, lot of the, a lot of the freedom of expression issues are coming through uh, expressions that are, uh, that are published from digitally the web. on the yes, web. From the web. So the pen actually has moved to the computer, the keyboard more. Yeah, and actually, you know, we have a charter, which Goldsworthy wrote the first um, draft of, and we, it's still more or less his. But we've been adding to it, so we now have a, basically a, a, a charter of uh, digital rights and obligations, which we adopted a year ago. And you say, well, that sounds boring. Well, actually, because it's done by writers, it's probably the first document on digital world which is readable by normal human beings. <laughs> you know, and it's short, yeah. it's clear, it's about rules that we can now say to governments and corporations, these are the rules. These are the rules, and we can fight on the basis of those rules. American Pen Center played a big role in putting that together with, with others. Well, what exactly are your, fo what are your focus areas in the American Pen? Well, I mean, we, as John was saying, the, the, we, one of the other advantages of this organization, you can imagine if you get more than two writers in a room, we'll disagree. And so one of the things about Pen is that we're not all, um, we don't march in ideological lockstep at all. No. You've got writers right across the spectrum of political views and um, having, who would hotly debate almost everything except this central maypole around which we dance, which is the freedom of expression maypole. Um, so there's no, I mean, you know, we, we on, on almost everything else, we represent an entire spectrum politically. Right. So, so in America, we have, I mean, we have a number of issues at the moment, of course, um, uh, one of our big, one of our big, um, uh, what I meant to say, sorry, but before I go on to that is that Penn has the advantage of not being rooted anywhere. It doesn't feel like some sort of neo-colonial body where there's a mothership from a particular country. These 146 branches now are all completely, they're autonomous. They're, they're a product it's each of their own country. It's a federation. Yes. It's a federation. It's a loose federation that, that has these things in common. So, um, so in that sense, when we go and help people, people in other countries, which we often do, um, mm. We also, we also have to take care of what's going on in our own country. So in, uh, you know, one of the big issues we've got at the moment, which you will probably have read about, is the whole issue of the NSA surveillance right, in, in, in America. And that's all about, so we're very, we're very um, that's one of the big issues that we're, we're battling at the moment. Um, that's probably our main preoccupation. We got very involved in Guantanamo when that was opened up, um, right. and we, 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 that became an issue for us too. Um, and we, we also um, we helped to set up, we help where we can to set, set up pens uh, in different countries. Um, there's a new pen that's just started in, um, in Burma, Myanmar, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and we, we have an annual prize, a Freedom, um, freedom to Write Award, which is usually given to an imprisoned writer, um, uh, and you know, we, for example, we g gave it the year before last to Eskinder Neger, who's a, who's an Ethiopian writer who's still in prison today. Um, so we have a we have a, a very we have a prison writing organisation that helps um, people in prison uh, to write. Mm -hmm. um, we have a translation committee. That what we do is we. The English speaking world, the, the American in particular, is not very good at um, at translating foreign writing. There are these wonderful works in foreign languages, and the publishers don't know how good they are. The American publishers, because they don't speak the languages, so it's a sort of vicious circle in terms That's of getting them translated. Yeah. So we have this uh, translation committee made up of the best translators uh, in the country, and they find works of art that they think deserve translating. We then fund those original translations and about 80, 85 percent of them go on to get published. So there are, you know, Penn is interesting because it's got these two different 
um, wings. So wings. So there's a freedom of expression wing, and there's right. and there's um, a, a celebration of literature wing. When we don't we, we we don't forget that bit as well. Right. But they are sort of uh, complementary, aren't they? I mean, without Absolutely. one, the other doesn't well, exist. Well, you know, there used to be for a long time, because it's a very you know, it's we've had a lot of experience. There used to be kind of a fight inside Penn. People say, well, this is a literary organization, it's a freedom of expression organization. And, and one of the central things I said when I was elected, this is really easy, I said, it's exactly the same thing. Mm. You know, you, you, you don't have one without the other. And when you're in a dictatorship or where there's heavy censorship and somebody writes an important piece of literature, that will be a step towards more freedom of expression. Right. And when people are fighting for the most basic freedom of expression, that will have an effect on literature. There's no, you know, good literature is essentially freedom of expression. You've said that before in your yeah. essay. It's That's uncomfortable. It's yeah. very uncomfortable. Yeah. We're not in the, you know, writers aren't in the business of being loved, even if we eventually they get are. senile <laughs> enough that we are. But we're ben basically in the business of creating mirrors that people live, see themselves in and find themselves in. It's not comfortable. It's not meant to be, you know. Sometimes you get deluded by mirrors as well. Of course, absolutely, many it's complicated. Jerry, in Bombay, what, what are the focus areas and what exactly does PN do in Bombay? Uh, I'm, I want to say this without any uh, sense of, of being rude to an organization that I belong. And I'm implicating myself when I say that the PEN in India is a history of failure. We have never intervened successfully in any battle for freedom of expression. We have never managed to take people with us and convince them that freedom of expression is important for everyone. We've signally failed in our attempts to reach young people and to tell them that if they feel that freedom of expression is important, then they must be on our side when something someone attacks a journalist suppose for instance in india in bombay a journalist asks a question would you rather have a statue of a leader or would you rather have a sewer system a new sewage system that would keep the city clean the followers of that leader of that leader will attack the journalist who asked the question the journalist will not ask another question but the result is, the shocking thing is, the terrifying thing for me as a writer is, I won't ask that question either. Our worst censors in India are, are inside our heads. This is because we have, I think what we feel as Indians is I have the right to say anything I want, but I have no responsibility to listen to a, a point of view that is not mine. And I think I myself know that I am guilty of this on occasion. I do not say that I am free of this. I am an Indian after all, and I live within a cocoon in which I write. And this cocoon is the cocoon of English, which reaches only a very small percentage of India. This means that sometimes I can write knowing that I can skate a very thin line using irony, using sarcasm, using tools that are specific to the Anglophone world, but which will get me past the people who are watching for offense. This means I and my little coterie of people who understand my sophistication and my sophistication levels will get how brave I am being will get how anti-establishment I am being, while the establishment will pass, ignoring me. Does this mean I have been brave? Or does this mean I have, been, I have performed acts of bravery in order to impress those whom I would impress, to impress those with whom I will share after dinner conversation? Does this mean I have taken the fight to where the fight actually is? I do not know. I do not know and because I come from a tradition, from a PEN in which the president of the PEN at the time when the fatwa against Salman Rushdie was passed, the president said that he supported the ban on Salman Rushdie's satanic verses in India. 
the president of Delhi. Of, 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 of uh, the PEN All India Center. At that time, a poet who is now dead. Uh, I remember that there was a great amount of anger among all the PEN body. And we spoke heatedly with him, and he defended his view, and he actually printed, uh, had an article printed in the local press where he said, the role of the intellectual is not to disturb the people. And I, I wrote back to the same paper saying, there is only one role that the people have, that the intellectual has, which is to keep disturbing the people. Now I'm asking you this. Don't, don't, don't clap right now because this is wonderful when I'm actually saying this and you know, you're not being hurt. Because if you look at where the attacks on freedom of speech have come in this country, they have not come, they have come from government to some extent, but they have also come from non-government lumpen organizations that are supported by popular demand. That if someone decides, for instance, to make a film in which there, is, there are two women who enter into a sexual relationship, like fire, and a, a, a right-wing organization attacks it, okay? I do not see that the average film goer gets very excited in India. I do not see that we stand up for that filmmaker. And that, I think, is not just the failure, is the failure of the Indian PEN, and that is why I'm very glad that there are that we are starting afresh in a certain way in Delhi and I hope that we will broad base it because you do not know what the loss of freedom of speech is until suddenly one day by erosion, by flaking away, suddenly your tongue is silenced. Suddenly you have no right to speak. We are at a cusp. We are at, we would, shall I say this, that when we came, no I won't, but I mean we can talk about it later. Uh, it is an election year. This is a, an important moment. Where we stand will determine the, the tenor of our public discourse for the next few years. And even if, into inverted commas, the right party comes in, which is the non-right party, <laughs> are we still willing to allow them to keep cutting away at our freedom of speech? This yesterday morning, uh, one of the ministers said that the government will be watching Twitter and Facebook. That's right. Well, if the government has nothing better to do than to watch Twitter and Facebook, I would like to be government. <laughs> I'd like to spend my time watching Twitter and Facebook. It sounds like a fun job. <laughs> and I suppose... All the Twitter RT are supposed to build roads and provide schools and do health infrastructure and other things that government is supposed to be doing. For heaven's sake, did you get angry at that when the government said that they're watching Twitter and Facebook? Did you feel a sense of outrage or not? And if you did, what did you do about it? Because look, these are three of us and this is our pesha. This is our work. We want freedom of speech because this is who we are. But if you are a, a doctor or a lawyer or a therapist or a physicist, you're part of this battle. You must be with us. You must stand with us or else we all go down together. Can Actually, I just there is no us and them in yeah, this. Exactly, there is no standing with us or against us no, no, because we are all... Uh, you know, we are all affected. And I must say this, that Jerry, while I agree almost totally with you, at the same time, there have been uh, people who have been speaking out in every city against, uh, uh, against these um, um, imposed silencing, you know, by the government, by interest groups, by political, uh, lumpenized political parties, whatever. So that it's, not, it's not as bleak a situation as we in our desperation might believe. Uh, yes, sir. You, well, you want to I mean, do? first, uh, just let me say that that you know, Penn as an overall group took a very strong stand on the fatwa, clearly against it, um, and worked very hard on that issue. Um, the other thing is that Jerry mentioned this that uh, three days ago was it Wednesday? Wednesday anyway, um, in Delhi we launched a new Penn Center in India. We hope there'll be three eventually. This now makes two. 
And the Delhi Penn Center, it's Nilanjana Roy and Ratcha Davidar who've worked to put it together. The first meeting, it was clear that all the major writers of the Delhi area are going to join it. I think, you know, your center has how many members now? It's a um, 1,500 or something? No, just under 4,000. 4,000. And the Japanese center is close to that, I think. Uh, the Canadian center is 700. The British center, I think, is the one that's at 1,500. The Delhi center could easily have 1,500 members within a couple of years. And um, they are very clearly focused on how are we going to deal with these issues. And I'm on my way to see Jerry and the others in, um, um, in Bombay, where we'll talk about what can we do to get a hold of this question. How do we do this? No, the other, just it, one thing yeah. now, one question I have, uh, John, is that, uh, you know, when I joined the PEN long ago, many years ago, I had to fill out a form uh, where I had to specify my publications. Right. And if you did not have two publications, then you could not become a member of the PEN. Uh, so, you know, I was young at the time and, uh, and um, angry. <laughs> and uh, so I looked at this form which required me to have two books published. And it was a time when Indian publishing was very bleak. There was maybe one or two people and everybody wanted to be, you know, Nayantara Segal had a book. So who was going to publish Jerry Pinto's book? So I, I looked at this form and I thought, you elitist so-and-sos, uh, <laughs> you really don't want me to be a member. Uh, is this uh, still the case or do we have any way in which we broad base it so this becomes everyone's well, struggle? I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, 1921, 30, 40, 50, 60, the writing community was pretty small and uh, people tended to arrest and kill well-known writers. You know, they were looking for Nobel Prize winners they could put in jail and, you know, famous people they could put in jail, famous people they could put up against the wall and shoot. So it was a, the idea of freedom of expression and who did it was typical of the time, which was it was fairly elitist. And, and so it was these gatherings of all the people you study at school or some of them that you would study at school in all these different languages. And it, from the 60s on, it started to change because, of course, suddenly uh, journalism came into it. Suddenly there were thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of new people coming into writing. There were new kinds of writing. Uh, suddenly people were saying, uh, script writing. What's the matter with writing a script for a great movie? You know, shouldn't great film directors and script writers be members? Shouldn't translators be members? So today, we have tens of thousands of members, and many of them are not, I mean, it, each center defines it a bit differently, but, you know, the fact is, many of the centers have had screenwriters or, or film directors as president. Uh, David Cronenberg has played a big role in Canadian Pen, uh, for example. Uh, in your center, you have... Right, we, we, we had a big debate about um, um, two or three years ago where we changed our... Um, admission for full membership. You have different types of membership. You can be an associate member without publishing any books. And we changed it from two books to one book. Although, interesting enough, and this shows you wherever two writers are gathered in a room, they're bound to disagree on many things, that they w half the people wanted to take the word literary book out, the word literary out, and the other wouldn't agree to it. So it's, we, it's still in there, but who's to define what's a literary book and what isn't? Sorry, and you know, I'm just going to throw this into the pot as well. Uh, you know, uh, because if you are a journalist, for instance, though many working journalists will know that this is no longer the case, that if you are uh, sued, your organization, your media organization, will have lawyers on retainer who will help you work your way through it. So now what happens when to writers, like bloggers, you know, someone who's blogging on a regular basis and one day decides to, you know, is writing something that may offend the government? And uh, are those uh, people... So, so let me just go back a step, though. So the other side of it is you were saying we're all in it together. And the reality is, you know, what's, what's a book without readers? You know? I mean, you are... The, I mean, I say half, it's not numbers, but of importance, there are the writers and the readers, there are the speakers and the listeners. Are you listening quietly? I don't think so. Hmm. You know, and you're going to go home, you're going to talk to each other, you're going to have fights about it, you're going to come up to us afterwards, you're going to ask questions. I mean, it's the writing and the reading, the talking, the listening, the filmmaking, the watching. It's all one thing. So it's actually yours, you know, and we're not, we're not in charge of it. You're actually in charge of it. I mean, we're sort of the servants in a way. I mean, we're the egomaniac, thin-skinned, <laughs> difficult to deal with, you know, servants of the people. 
Totally. Yeah. <laughs> but also, just just to make sure, if if somebody's a blogger, for example, I mean, Eskinder Nega is a good example. He was blogging in, in yeah. Ethiopia, and he got thrown into jail. He he wasn't a pen member. He he didn't have. We took up his case because it was it was a, a pen worthy case. I mean, it was he was someone who was expressing himself. So we don't just go into bat for people who are members of pen. That's, That's right. not Over how 50, it works. Over fifty percent of the people we're defending who are on this list of eight hundred and fifty, over half of them are not pen members. And, you know, and I repeat this every time I get on a, anywhere in front of anything, which is t just, you know, this is really important. Uh, how many presidents and prime ministers are in prison today around the world? Three, four? You know, how many, uh, uh, how many uh, business leaders are in prison? There might be six or seven in China and Russia and one in the West, you know? Uh, how many economists? None, which is really odd. Uh, and bankers? <laughs> bankers? Bankers? Two or three bankers. How many writers? 850. So clearly we're doing it right. Clearly it matters. Clearly freedom of expression disturbs people who have authority, whether it's governmental, money, or military. We're doing it right because it's, about the, it's actually about you more than it is about us. And that's why this line between who we're defending and who are our members will always be changed. This is a period where everything is changing. Everything's changing. We have no, you know, I was at a meeting a couple of months, about a year ago, where 150 experts were talking about, we must move from the paper book to the email book. And there were four writers out of 150 of these sort of techno, techno t experts. And at the end of it, we all got up and laughed at them and said, first of all, we'll publish in whatever form exists. And secondly, will there be an e-book in five years? I mean, the way things are going, who knows what the technology will be. So we shouldn't become obsessed about, we're not in a period of obsessing about what is a book. We're in a period of massive change where we have to make sure we don't lose freedom of expression. And that's the big issue about the surveillance thing, which is since, since the 10-11 um, 10, 11, 10, 11, yes, crisis, governments of every sort around the world, democracies and non-democracies, have felt permission to break the law. So the government of the United States, of Canada, of India, I'm sure, of France, they're all breaking the law. Eventually their Supreme Courts, I think, will, will tell them that, but that's going to take 10 years. In the meantime, they've destroyed privacy, they're invading, they're listening, they're uh, manipulating, they're breaking every code which they're held by nationally and internationally. And you are not going into the streets about it. And that we spent 150 years about getting, you know, bills of right, charters of right, international whatevers of rights, including in India, and nobody is going into the streets about the fact that I would say 40% of it has been evaporated in the last 10 years with hardly a court case, let alone a demonstration in the streets. And that um, is problematic. Just as a matter of like, just in case you want some free irony, and irony comes calling in India, look behind us, look at who sponsored this tent. Google, guess who reads all your email? Google, guess who therefore can give you exactly the advertising that will target your, your email? Google. Now, this is a negotiation. This sitting here for the four of us with Google in the background is a negotiation and you might want to ask, is this also a compromise? And yes, there is going to be some measure of compromise in freedom of expression. I am going to two schools tomorrow. Okay? I will not use four-letter words in those schools. I'll censor myself because I know these are young people. And even if I can make them laugh like that, just by saying one four-letter word, I won't do it. That means already I'm censoring myself simply because I'm assuming sensitivities. I'm assuming sensitivities. Now, of course, if you listen to school children in the, in the short break, you will hear wonderfully <laughs> elegant and ripe expressions. <laughs> I was uh, in a playground uh, two weeks ago and one young boy told another young boy, I'll kick you in your tomatoes. <laughs> I thought that was beautiful. <laughs> and I registered it for future use because if, even if tomorrow I go and say in that school, hey, I'll kick you in your tomatoes, 
the teachers are not going to know how to respond to that and it is nice to disorient a teacher or two it gets your revenge back so i'm saying you know you're working i i know when i last time i spoke i sounded like a self righteous idiot i'm sorry i apologize i am a self righteous idiot very often but i'm saying i know for as an as a part of understanding that i live in a certain culture i work in a certain culture i enjoy the benefits of that work as well i get to come to jlf hey you know i get to sit on a stage and you get to have to listen poor babies <laughs> but at the same time i there are things about the culture that i am not happy with and you we need to give each other that space and sometimes i fail and sometimes you fail but hey let's just pull pull together and let's be worried yeah let's be worried about the about what we are doing to each other and we're doing it to each other as well as having it done to us simultaneously no, but jerry what you said about self censorship i'm sorry i'm just cutting in because i would want peter to come in on this um the self censorship part was extremely important especially in a country like ours where we have too many sensibilities where our sensitivities are very easily uh, hurt um we don't like irony because we you know we we like no. to twist no we don't like irony we don't like heard. satire we yeah. we we don't like the funnies um just say it as it is if you can't say it as it is don't just say it and if you want to be funny then we'll put you in jail because we'll twist it you know there are all kinds of things that we do as as a because it's not a uniform culture in any case it's it's just it's a very rich and complex uh a uh, mix of you know many cultures and many languages and many sensitivities and time zones, and time zones. Right. absolutely so you don't know as as jerry said who uh, who you are targeting is uh, uh is one part of it but who targets you as a result yeah. Yeah. is another and that's something that you can't always um, control control or yeah. predict can I, mean, can I, 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 can I think the oh issue sorry. i think the issue is that in a sense that freedom of expression is the right from which actually all other rights flow so all all other rights are built on that the way that you transparency in government in in fight against corruption everything is actually if you don't have freedom of expression all of the rest of it is compromised so i think that's why it's so important even in societies where there's enormous sectarian tensions there are different belief systems there are there are different types of sensitivities that m may differ across class and caste and religion it's it's and these all have to be negotiated i mean you i know you were being flippant about the school the school example but but i mean that exists all the time and 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 pen and and writers understand that Th these are these are negotiated things you negotiate them with yourself you negotiate them with each other you negotiate them with a so in a society i mean and and it's never easy i mean often these are these are very jagged difficult judgments the the danish cartoons for example you know that that caused enormous difficulty um and you have to ask yourself sometimes you know you find yourselves you can find yourself in a situation where you're defending something that you find offensive but you're defending the right for someone to say something and where does that right stop so that's that, you know, that is, is difficult a in in a country that is so volatile and that has so many hostilities like ours it is difficult so one of the and one of the difficulties is that if you are a, if you are an intolerant group the way that you shrink the the forum for public discourse is you just threaten violence whenever you don't like something Absolutely. and then you the government says oh no 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 we silence. can't do this because yes. this group will go and kill people and we have a public security situation but you know if you know as you saying that you, there's got to be a line drawn against that otherwise we're all intimidated all the time and we become the smallest society that we are when nobody talks to each other and there's no and that zone of tolerance kind of disappears and ultimately that's terrible for democracy so we and also in other words we we defend the specific cases if there's an attack on freedom of expression as an international organization we get to work right we get to work but the the work beside that is going into the society and saying okay how can we expand the space of debate and convince people politicians mm -hmm. business leaders um religious leaders that actually debate is better than violence that debate is better than fear that actually 
even some of relatively unpleasant people will have a better time through debate than through authoritarianism. I mean, I'll give you an example in China. I, I mean, there's a very well-known journalist who was arrested a couple of years ago um, because he'd insulted two, he'd attacked two well-known party figures for corruption. One of them was subsequently tied, uh, tried and hung. The other was promoted. As soon as he was promoted, he had uh, the journalist arrested. And then we began a very difficult thing to get him out. We actually got him out through, I know, because I was directly involved in it with my wife, with a direct intervention at a high level, got him out of prison. It then took two more years to get him out of the country because he was in terrible condition in the country. Um, five years later or whatever, uh, a senior Chinese official is arrested for corruption and his wife for murder, Mr. Bo. Right. That was the guy. So you have to say to yourself, would the Chinese government not have done better to have said this journalist is actually on our side because they're doing the job against corruption in a way that a bureaucrat or a politician can't. But they haven't actually figured that out. So a lot of our job is sort of cutting edge, sometimes courageous, uh, education of people who simply don't understand. We, we do things in the streets, we do things li in, in literary places, we go into politicians' offices, but the difference between us and other, most other NGOs is when we, I know whenever I go into a minister's office, I, I've discovered this right away when we did that delegation to Mexico where Mexico is the second most dangerous place in the world to be a writer. They, they don't arrest you, they just kill you. And put, your, put your head on a pike and put a sign underneath it. They had about 100 killed in the last little while. And the minister said something, Minister of Justice, and I immediately said, Minister, you know, we're delighted to be here, but I have to tell you that um, we're here in this room speaking to you, but everything you say to us will be reported to people in over 100 countries, and they will be writing about what you've said in every language of the world. And then the conversation changed completely because they suddenly realized they don't have control over you. We have this enormous power. That's why they're in jail, because we have a gigantic power. We just have to use it with sophistication. And you have to want to use it with pleasure and anger. And, and the last thing, the humor thing, everybody in power, businessman, religious leader, politician, hates humor. Because humor is, the, is, is, is the, the ultimate attack. Weapon. It's the weapon it's, it's of the, the, ultimate weapon. Uh, of the they, powerless. They don't it? mind you know, one of us coming into the room and saying, sir, what you're doing is, and then we go on very lugubriously about the terrible things they're doing. They don't mind that at all, because they reply in an equally boring way. But what they hate is if we make fun of them. Because when we make fun of them, everybody understands it, and they lose their sense of the magnificence of their position. There's a little poof. You know, so literature starts to a great extent in humor and irony. Absolutely. Bring and there is always, uh, you know, uh, when I go and talk about freedom of expression in schools or in colleges, people say, but what yes, can I do? Want. I'm just a secretary, or I'm just a teacher, or I'm just whoever that person is. The best is I'm just a housewife. Oh, yes, just a housewife. Or just a mother. I'm like, <laughs> and the first thing I, I say is, uh, you can write a letter. This year at Sophia in the Social Communication Media Department, we did an exercise called Constructive Complaining. We got every student to talk about something that really upsets them, something that they've seen that upsets them, and then we said, write a letter about it, and then report back. In out of 40 cases, and this is in Bombay, one of the worst and most indisciplined cities there is, out of 40 complaints that were filed, 23 were acted upon. Just because one student wrote one letter of one complaint about one thing that she or he felt strongly about. Multiply this effect. You don't like an ad, look carefully at the ad, see who's offended you, write to them and say why you've been offended. You don't like something that is in the paper, write to the editor. You don't like something that's happening in your, in your society, write about it. Everybody's a writer. But Jerry, 
where do they write about it you know see this the media, is media the uh, the media itself has become extremely uh, uh, censored but you, you know but you it, know that's the other uh, thing i mean sorry we're just going to get to, yeah, to but just so get your questions ready we're coming but you'd be surprised one minute. even if your local member of parliament is corrupt hmm. even if they're ineffective you'd be amazed if you go to them you've got to vote you go to them and you say I want you to do something about this. Don't go to the prime minister. Don't go to and go to your member of parliament. And say I want you to do this. And and basically, you're saying if you don't do something about it, me and my friends, we're going to talk about the fact that you failed us. You know, you hold them to the line on these issues, really. And I'm not. I'm on, I'm not even saying write a letter to the editor. Though I think that if the media offends you, you must write a letter to the editor. Uh, I'm saying there's the press council of India. There's the Consumer Guidance Society of India. There's the Advertising Standards Council. There are people like that who are these bodies that are supposed to be that are supposed to be doing this, this stuff absolutely. for you. And if you are offended by sexism, for instance, there is a semi-naked woman in an ad for a car, and you don't want that to be happening, start speaking. And okay, if, even if you fail, at least you have tried. At least those words are not caught in your mouth, in your throat, and are not burning you. At least you have tried. Okay, and I'll, I'll just yes. tell you one thing very quickly. But two years ago, a political group wanted some publicity. They chose a book, Rohinton Mysteries, uh, uh, A Fine Balance, which many of you probably read, a great novel. They burnt a whole bunch of them. They threatened the university in Mumbai. What is it called? The University of Mumbai. Of Mumbai. And the vice rector caved and withdrew the book from the university. You guys intervened. We intervened. The vice rector has been silent ever since. I promise you when I come to Mumbai, I'll be raising the question. But why aren't you all, all of you, writing to the vice rector, writing pro public letters saying, because if he can ban uh, uh, that novel, he can ban anything under a little bit of pressure, you know? Yeah, so that's, that's true. Uh, but, uh, yeah. We're going also, to the floor. We are right? going to the floor now. Oh, just one uh, little thing to Jerry. All these organizations that are supposed to be dealing with this are toothless. They can't actually do anything. They don't have any power to do other than grumble. So what we can do is we can organize the grumbling. And organized grumbling actually has some kind of effect. Yeah, well. organized grumbling is a lovely <laughs> way of putting it. Yeah. And we have Harsh Mandar here who did the right to information. So I hope, I wonder right. if we could just bring him into the discussion. Yes, but we, we just have a little over five minutes. So. Yeah. Question there, there's a hand. Um, Gosh. Yes. Get up. No. Uh, 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 I have a question. Um, uh, sort of uh, starting with a statement. No, no, no statement. Only question, very okay, quickly. Fine. So the Sorry. question is um, I know a person in Calcutta who is uh, earning, say, seven to eight thousand rupees a month, and he is working for PEN International for the last ten years, and uh, he has uh, discovered many a talent from Bengal and related villages, but till date, he hasn't got any recognition. And every time he has approached the PEN International, there has been uh, responses that we are going to do something, but it never occurred. So sorry, I take sorry, we, we don't have a pen, we don't have a pen center in Calcutta. No, I'd be very interested to know who this person is. Yes, I would, I would come you to... Come I, and tell me, after, because we, I, we do not have a pen center yeah, in Calgary. We do not have, and that is uh, the thing that my question was. Basically, you know, I'll pick up what Antara just said, toothless, and I will take uh, what Jerry said, PEN. So it's just a toothless PEN center. So no, there is no center. There is no center in Calcutta. Can we have the next question, please? Yeah. Next question. Yes, uh, uh, go ahead. And who, who's the uh, Okay. Um, yes. Uh, what do you have to say about this? Uh, Professor Amrita Sen started uh, and many years ago. Let me go back to his. No, don't role. please don't go back. Just come to the question. Yes, I'm coming to that. He he said that the Indian democracy and freedom of expression ensured that there's no famine, unlike China. But he also says that. But there is mass, persistent hunger, largest infant mortality, largest number of hungry That's right. people, That's and, right. and the media is silent about it. There is a mass culture of silence. There's also a need for level playing field where everybody has equal right of expression. You're quite right. Where, uh, how do we bring about that? 
Okay, uh, as a representative of the Indian media, I think that I'm the only representative no, here. I too. Uh, okay, the two of us. Obviously, I'm an editor. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, sorry, sorry. Journalist. I'm saying mass media. It, this is yeah, mass media, but mass sorry, media. sorry. I'm a columnist in mass no, media. No, no, I've been so with mass media please? for 22 so, years. Okay, sorry. Uh, would you take that, Amat? I mean, uh, Antara then? Sorry. No, no, you, you answer no, no, it no, if no. you want. No, no, really. Seriously. Do, uh, if you don't, no, I, I will. I, I, okay, I, the, the thing is that Indian mass media has been uh, very scared of late. It has been extremely brilliantly combative earlier, but these days there has been a silencing of the media. Editors uh, have not been as courageous as they were earlier. There has been a self-censorship. I think part of it is because the, the playing field has changed. A lot of journalists have become players themselves. It's not just a question of uh, being a watchdog. It's also a question of be participating in the larger political scheme of things. So um, it's a very big question. We sh shouldn't get into it right now. So is there any anything else? Yeah. Hi. The, uh, can the I ask uh, a question about what uh, Penn does a lot of work in developing and democratizing countries. What does Penn do in developed countries? For instance, everyone would recall that the New York Times, which regards itself as the best paper in the world, supported the war in Iraq. What did Penn do about those kinds of situations which affect the lives of millions, literally? So, sorry, the, the, you, you're right, so, but it's not a freedom of expression issue. In other words, a lot of writers stood up and spoke out and against and criticized that. But it's not Penn's job to convince the American government not to start a war. That's not what we do. We try to make it possible that there is the debate. And I would say that the active Penn centers usually spend about half their time criticizing authorities inside their country and half the time dealing with international issues. That's a kind of healthy balance. It sometimes goes one way or another. But I've attacked my own government as a Penn leader in Canada more times than you can imagine. I attack them on things like burning of books, seizures of books, books being stopped at borders, uh, uh, structures being taken away from indigenous groups who want to publish things. Uh, universities limiting what's read in universities, freedom of expression issues. You're talking about a political issue, and that's about the citizens standing up and saying, I'm not going to buy your newspaper if you take that stand. That's your power. You don't have to read that newspaper. Absolutely. You know? Yes, this gentleman here. Just, just, uh, uh, so. You don't have a. Yeah, in the recent past in India, you don't have what? Banning of the 300 Ramayanas of A.K. Ramanujam by Delhi University, the Rohintan mystery case, and also in Jaipur Literature Festival cases were filed uh, against four authors. So do you think that in the recent past, we as Indians have become more and more intolerant about the freedom of expression and speech? And the second question is that uh, how good a fundamental right of freedom and of speech and expression does to us if it comes with a rider of not offending others? Okay, I'll... Uh, you take the second part, I'll take the first part. So, <laughs> uh, the first question, yes, we have got a lot more sensitive. If you read the Constituent Assembly debates, uh, you know, the Constituent Assembly debates are among the finest writing in India. They are large volume, but you will have such surprises. Hindus standing up for the right to conversion, people saying that there should be freedom of speech, when you would think that they would not be the kind. And at the same time, you have to understand that this is a country where we have 10,000, we have, look at your 500 rupee note. It has 11 scripts on it. Scripts, different scripts. So this is not one India we are talking about. So are we getting a lot more sensitive? Yes. Are we doing anything about it? Not much. And your second question was? How, how good is freedom of expression? How good is freedom of expression? Okay, let me just run a uh, thing by you. I, uh, may I insult and offend you? No, you may not. Please, I, we do not want any more controversies here. No, no, so. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> if I were to express myself and as an insult to you or to your mother, you would get angry, you would hurt me, I would then be forced to hurt you. The, this would be laid at the feet of freedom of speech. It would not be laid at your feet or my feet. It, freedom of speech would be blamed. 
any dictator who wants to come along and curtail our freedom of speech would say, look, I gave you freedom of speech and you guys abused it and now you caused public and afraid. Now no one gets freedom of speech. Bus, quiet, all of you go home. So it is better for all of us to try and respect each other's sensitivities while understanding that upsetting each other may also be a way forward. This is a difficult negotiation. It is not easy. But hey, look around you. India is not easy. Absolutely. And a, lo and a lot That's of it, it is, you know, a, a lot of it is practice. I mean, you know, as writers, we start out our lives being insulted. You know, you publish your first book and you read the reviews. And, you know, I remember when I read the first review of my first novel, I thought to myself, what will my mother think? <laughs> you know, because it was so awful. It was so insulting. And I thought, oh, my God, she sees it. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and then you get used to it. Your skin gets thicker and you learn to live with controversy, with debate, with disagreement. Countries are the same thing. You learn how to have disagreements. I, you know, I find... I'm quite optimistic, and I'm not, the, I'm not your Thomas Friedman who takes a, a fancy car from the airport and goes to a gated community and declares the future of India, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so yeah. <laughs> I didn't even have to say that. <laughs> so, so it was a cheap comment. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, I must say this week being here, and I come every couple of years, I'm really quite encouraged. I think a lot of young people are very determined to see more freedom of expression. The reading is amazing. I think there's a lot of energy, but the reality is it's slogging, slogging in the trenches, learning to be insulted without responding the next step up, which is violence, learning to just have shouting matches and arguments and, and freedom of expression functioning. And you get used to it. And you cool off and you go and have a drink and I don't know. And buy yeah. your little magazines and buy the small newspapers and look for alternative media and get civil society and get magazines that aren't mainstream. You know, go out and look for the stuff that excites you. And Don't let yourself be seduced by the mainstream and by the seductions of Bollywood. Look for other stuff, yeah? Yay, and there's a, there's exactly so much it. out there. <laughs> there's and a that, lot out there. And, and, and as editor and of the is, little magazine, I would also encourage you to do and exactly that's the that. answer to the question from the lady about the New York Times. We, we act as if these newspapers are God. They're just newspapers or magazines. They come and go. They're, they're nothing unless they're good. So if you don't like what they're saying, don't read them. Start one yourself online. Read one, read some little magazine or something. It might be far better. I mean, it's up to you. You actually own the right to read what you want to read and not read what and you don't And now want it's to read. become much easier because of the web and you have blogs, you yeah. can express yourself, you have Twitter, you have SMS communication has become really so interesting and, and so free that freedom of expression actually and has... And if I can just put in one little thing about the, the, insult, the insulting no. and whatever, just remember the, the power of ignoring something. <laughs> that actually, you know, the person who insults you wants you to react. If you just don't react, then they've got no oxygen. And it's, you know, people often forget that that's your main power because th you're not doing what they want you to do. That's right. That's absolutely it. Okay, I think we're completely out of time. Do you yeah, want okay. a last There's a young comment? Woman there who maybe it would be nice to hear yeah. from right there. She's saying yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, right. just just very quick, one last question. Uh, yes. We are actually at 4:30 now. Time is up. Time up. Sorry. Time is up. Okay. Sorry. Could you? Come okay, up one later? big row for come freedom of expression. Yeah. Freedom of expression. Yay! <laughs> Zindabad, idiot. Zindabad. Freedom of expression. Zindabad. Freedom of expression. Freedom of expression! Zindabad! Yay, yeah, thank you. Thank you so very much, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, John, Peter, and Andra, thank you so very much. And Zindabad. I'm so sorry. I really